Let's talk about FastGC. FastGC. What is FastGC? Well, there's no formal definition, but at the recent Pittsburgh conference, I gave three definitions of something called faster GC, fast GC, and really fast GC. And this is based on simplicity, because faster GC is something that everybody could do with an older instrument with not much time. You just cut the column in half, maybe you double the flow rate, and if necessary, you may have to buy one column. But you could easily cut the time in half and sometimes to one third. That's faster GC. But the main topic is fast GC. Now, fast GC, as you read about, think about today, is, well, you better know some GC theory, like the Van Diemter equation. Because first of all, you're going to buy a new column. It's going to be shorter. But shorter columns give you a faster analysis, you know, for both isothermal and not so much for temperature programming. So we also need, if we're going to do temperature programming with more complex samples, we're going to have, have a smaller ID and a thinner film. And finally, ultra-fast GC, that's going to take some special instrumentation. Ultra-fast injection techniques, we'll come to that at the end of this seminar. Lee, talk to me a little bit about why would one, somebody want to do fast GC? You know, uh, the whole idea of doing gas chromatography means that we want to find out what's in something. We need to find out what's in the sample. Uh, and find out what's in the sample um, when it's too late doesn't do you much good. So telling you that, hey, by the way, yesterday that batch of plastic that you made is, is off spec, uh, that would have been really useful information at the time I was making the batch when I could have done something about it. So I think the idea of, of shortening the analysis time or getting to a faster uh, result is really important because it makes GC more real time. Imagine if in a, in a, in a perfect world we get a GC result in a matter of seconds instead of a matter of minutes or hours. If you get a result in, in seconds, you could do something about it. You can, uh, you can correct the problem before it continues to be a problem. I, I really like uh, Professor McNair's definitions of faster, fast, and really fast, uh, because no one has really put a definition. People ask, you know, what is fast GC? What is the definition of it? I, I love the idea that um, it's a good separation done quickly. And I, I like your, your first statement, faster GC means hey, you already have a gas chromatograph. Uh, how do you make that faster? How do you make the results come off more, more quickly while keeping the results good? And uh, the simple answer is, like you said, cut the column in half, cut your analysis time in half. Works really well if you're doing isothermal analysis. Uh, the downside to cutting the column in half, of course, is that uh, we lose half the efficiency. So um, if you think about then stepping up to what Professor McNair has called fast GC, sort of the second level up, it means why don't you buy a new column that's half the length and half the diameter. So if you think about this, if you cut the length in half, you cut your analysis time in half. But we lose efficiency, we lose resolution. If you cut the diameter in half, you double the efficiency. So if you cut the length in half and the diameter in half, then you get the same efficiency, but it works in half the time. So like Professor McNair said, uh, fast GC requires you to buy a new column but it's not uh, a big stretch. You already have the GC, you already have the parameters. It's just a matter of half the length, half the diameter, uh, and take that step. And then the ultra-fast GC, uh, I, I love, because that really is sort of, I would say, the future of GC. You're looking at um, much faster injections, uh, higher split ratios, uh, maybe faster temperature programming, higher uh, voltage power supply in, in your GC, uh, low thermal mass uh, ovens. Um, and that, to me, is the uh, sort of the roadmap of where we uh, could go, where we should go in the world of gas chromatography. The thing about the faster GC is that it's fairly simple to do over systems, and you could probably still do manual injections. But fast GC, you better be using auto samplers. Really fast GC, you better be using really fast, you know, auto sampling devices as well. And also, the really fast, we'll talk about a little bit later, you have to have a very fast time constant. Some detectors will not do really fast GC. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great point. Let's move on to the topic of why would you want to do fast, G, fast GC in the first place? What are some advantages of this technique? You know, the advantage of fast GC is you get your answers more quickly. So uh, what does that mean? That means you could uh, 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 run your samples in half the time. You get to go home early every day. Or your boss will probably make you run more samples that day. But the idea is higher th sample throughput, more samples per unit time. Um, maybe you, you, uh, that allows you to, uh, to get more points of information during a reaction. 
Uh, maybe it means it, 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 that you can get that information to the um, uh, back to the plant uh, people uh, faster if you could do uh, faster gas chromatography. Uh, what do you think about the idea of, of, of doing fast GC? What's the advantage of it? You know, I'm trained as an analytical chemist. And I've been doing analytical analysis for a long time, so I like better data. Let's just say you've got a 10-minute method. And with faster GC, the new column, smaller ID, what if you could do the, the analysis in one-fourth the time? Imagine this. What if you did a blank, two duplicates, and another blank? Imagine how many mistakes you would avoid. Imagine the better quality data. How many laboratories do one blank in the morning, 20 to 40 samples, and maybe a blank in the evening and find, oh my God, we've got a big problem with blanks. The SGC would allow you to get a lot better data to do those duplicates and minimize some of those human error factors. That's my big thing. Wow, I really like that concept. I honestly I had not thought of that, but, but really that opens up the idea of producing better quality data. So if you have uh, a really important uh, data analysis to do, let's say you're in a forensics lab, uh, of course you want to be very careful with reporting the correct uh, information, it would be ideal to run a blank in between every sample. Uh, so you run a sample and then a blank and a sample and a blank, and that way you have proof that there's no carryover. I mean, you could theorize about carryover. You could say, wow, I had sample in the, uh, in, in, in the needle, in the barrel, in the plunger, in the injector, in the column, the detector. How am I sure it all got washed out in between samples? Well, the proof is in the pudding. If you actually run a blank right. in between each sample, uh, that enough. means you have, you, you have proof of it. So I love that idea. So FASTGC allows us to get to higher quality results. Let's dig into ways to do faster GC. We've mentioned several of them already. I like the one shorter column. But keep in mind, analysis time is directly proportional to length only in isothermal. And this typically says a small number of peaks, simple analysis, and something which many of you are doing. But if you've got more than 10 peaks in a complex sample where you have to do temperature programming, if you cut the column in half, you know, that will not give you half the analysis time because temperature programming is dependent much more on the programming rate, the degrees per minute. How fast are you heating? Five degrees or 10 degrees than just the simple column length. So that's one fact. What's another fact? You know, I, just to build on that point real quick, I think that's such, a, such an important point because people forget about the fact that um, the amount of time it takes an analyte to come off the column. In the isothermal world, we know that it's a function of, uh, of, of temperature, and flow rate. So if you double the flow rate, you cut the analysis time in half. If you cut the column in half, you cut the analysis time in half. But once you enter the world of temperature programming, it's really the elution temperature of a molecule that determines its retention time. So you got to get the column hot enough to get the peak off the column. So if you want to do fast GC with a temperature program, then that means you need to have a faster temperature program. Mechanically, you have to have a GC that can heat up faster, that could pour, put more heat into the column in a shorter amount of time, so faster rates. Let's define for our audience out there, elution temperature. Hmm. What is that? Yeah, <laughs> elution temperature, you know, most of us think about chromatography as, as looking at peaks retention times, which is great. That's how we identify things. How long did it take, take that peak to come off the column? But if you really dig into it, it's really more a function of the temperature of the column than anything else. So an analyte must be volatile enough to travel through the column. Right. The higher the temperature of the column, the more the analyte is in the gas phase because of its uh, vapor pressure, uh, and the faster it elutes. So it's really, ultimately, the temperature of the column. So we call that the elution temperature. The elution temperature is the temperature at which the compound elutes from the column. Good. The next thing I like to think about is your flow rate. Of course, you all know the Van Diemter equation. Well, you probably don't. You should know the Van Diemter equation. That's correct. The Van Diemter equation says, what is the effect of the flow rate on HETP, height equivalent to one theoretical plate. If you plot the inverse of that, the inverse of the Van Diemter plot is efficiency in number of theoretical plates as a function of flow rate. And the Van Diemter equation shows you very clearly there's a minimum in the H, there's a maximum in the number of plates as a function of flow rate. There is one column flow rate that gives you the maximum column efficiency. What is that flow rate? <laughs> Uh, you know, if we think about flow rates, every column has a different optimum flow rate, but every column has the same optimum linear velocity. So roughly speaking, if you're running 25 centimeters per second, uh, that's for helium, you're at or very near that optimum linear velocity. Now, you'll, you'll hear some people say the optimum linear velocity for helium is 20, 
some people say 25, some people say 30, and my answer is they're all right. Everyone is correct. And you know, how can everyone be right? Well, if you look at the bottom of the Van Diemter, the, 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 the optimum Van, Van Diemter, it, it's relatively flat at its optimum. So 20, 25, 30 all give us uh, roughly uh, the, the same number of theoretical plates, the highest efficiency. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, for my money, I always go with the 30 because uh, I'm impatient and I like to see things uh, come off faster. But I think it's a really important point. People talk about, oh, linear velocity is complicated. I don't want to think about that. My argument is I think linear velocity is much simpler than flow rate. More importantly, there's only one number you need to remember. If you remember 25 centimeters per second, you are at or near the optimum linear velocity for helium for any capillary column in the world. Let's just throw in one monkey wrench. A lot of people are asking me about using hydrogen as a carrier gas. Cost of helium is going up. People are worried about the supply of helium. Personally, I don't believe there's a problem. I think we're going to see with all the fracking going on in the United States, there's going to be plenty of helium. But just for discussion, the bad thing about hydrogen, of course, it's faster. It has a faster, you know, optimum velocity. You can operate hydrogen, you know, at a much faster velocity to get the same efficiency, actually slightly better than with helium. However, hydrogen poses a few problems. One of them is, you know, potentially explosive. Hydrogen plus oxygen makes a boom <laughs> of explosion. And the health and safety people frown upon explosions in the laboratory, so <laughs> no explosions in your lab. But hydrogen could be used and easily would give you a faster analysis provided you have certain precautions and, and go with that. What's some other considerations with hydrogen? What would you think about how do we generate hydrogen safely? Yeah, you know, I think the whole idea of hydrogen, you know, people are afraid of hydrogen because for good reason. I mean, it is explosive. 4% mixture in the, in the atmosphere makes a, an explosive mixture. But uh, the way I always like to put it is we're all worried about running hydrogen through our column at 1 or 2 or 3 mils a minute. Yet every single one of us runs hydrogen through our detector at 40 mils a minute. So we already have hydrogen. We're already running 40 mils a minute through our FID. Uh, and just for, uh, if you want to talk about a safety issue, we have 40 mils a minute of hydrogen. We're pumping in 400 mils a minute of air. And we put a little flame on the top of it. So we all use FIDs. We use them safely. There's, uh, there's not an issue with running an FID. So to me, the, the safety issue of hydrogen is not that we're running one or two mils a minute through the column. It's the fact that we have a big tank of hydrogen sitting somewhere down the hall. That is a safety uh, consideration. So I'm a big fan of the hydrogen generator. Hydrogen generators are fantastic. You add water and it makes hydrogen. I mean, we all learned in, in uh, you know, grade school and high school that if you hydrolyze water, you get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So the way these generators work, you add water. You know, I say well, we have a, a hydrogen generator in our lab. Uh, we add you know, a, a gallon of water a month, and it provides hydrogen for all of our GCs, and it does it seamlessly. So uh, it doesn't store any hydrogen. It produces it on demand. Um, let's say the older hydrogen generators will run up to 60 PSI. Some of the newer ones will take you to 100, 150 PSI. Uh, so uh, to me, that's the issue with, uh, with hydrogen is if we get rid of the cylinder, then we can get rid of the, the major safety concern ab about hydrogen. So I'm a big fan, or, or I guess uh, I agree with you. I would like to see if, if helium is really running out. Um, you know, helium is great, it's easy. If you want to switch to hydrogen, it's a fairly simple process. Just switch over to hydrogen. The advantage, slightly higher uh, linear velocities to give you the same efficiency. Um, the only time I'm, I would say I would be cautious, or I would suggest that you think about your hydrogen uh, use of hydrogen as a carrier gas is in two scenarios, if you're doing headspace and if you're doing GC mass spec. Mm. In the headspace world, uh, and it depends on your headspace auto sampler, but most headspace auto samplers will pressurize the vial with the carrier gas, which is, in this case, hydrogen. So think about this. You've got a 40 mil vial. What's already in the vial? Well, already in the vial, I have oxygen because there's air in there. I pump in a bunch of hydrogen. I have now pumped an explosive mixture into an enclosed container. We call that a pipe bomb. So <laughs> we don't want that in the laboratory. Uh, if there were an ignition source, then it would be it would be a problem. So that's the only area that I say, if you're doing uh, headspace, think very carefully about using hydrogen carrier gas. There are new uh, 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 headspace auto samplers out there. The, one of the new ones that just came out actually uses a separate gas to pressurize. So you could actually pump in nitrogen or helium to pressurize, and then you could still use hydrogen uh, carrier gas. The other issue is um, uh, the only place that I say, you know, proceed with caution is for GC mass spec. 
Um, I think there's a, a number of, of questions about hydrogen GC mass spec. One of them is the pumping efficiency. GC mass spec must operate in a vacuum, a, a pretty right. significant vacuum. High vacuum, yeah. And in order to achieve that vacuum, you have to have a, a pump that can pull out all the molecules. Hydrogen diffuses, it's, it's harder to pump down uh, hydrogen. So uh, that is a, a potential a question, uh, or at least something worth thinking about before you jump to hydrogen. Short of that, you could run hydrogen uh, on a capillary column for just about any application that's out there and get great results. I think the last point I want to bring up is something about, for many years at the short courses, I've always said to people, bring us a sample. I'll bet you a beer and a pizza we can do the analysis twice as fast, maybe three times as fast, easily. And most of the time, there's a lack of common sense. The most common problem I knew simply was that people separated every peak with maximum resolution, common sense. Many samples, you know, there are a couple of important peaks. Make sure you separate those peaks which are critical to your product, to your analysis, mm -hmm. to your criterion of quality control. The other peaks, oftentimes it's just some garbage at the end of the column. Don't worry about them. So use common sense and optimize based on those peaks which are critical. Maximize that resolution. And the last one is several times people just had the wrong column. We've been talking about theoretical plates and, and resolution in that sense. The alpha value, the selectivity of the column is another one. If people are trying to separate orthometaparaxylene with a DB5, DB1 column, good luck. You probably won't succeed. I saw people trying a 100 meter column one time. And I said, you know, a carbo wax column, different polarity, higher polarity, different alga, that's a very simple five minute separation. So common sense should also play a role here. Yeah, that's a great point. And I got to say, I, I learned a, a great phrase from a, from a very wise old man, my professor, Harold McNair in graduate <laughs> school, that you need as much resolution as you need. Uh, a lot of chromatographers believe that they were put on this planet to maximize resolution. That's not our job. Our job is to give adequate resolution in the shortest amount of time. Now, you have to determine what adequate means. But once you get to a resolution of 1.5 or 2.0, if you're really conservative, you may say 2.5, uh, that's as much as you need. There's no real benefit to having resolution greater than that. So uh, one of the things that, 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 I, uh, that I learned from Professor McNair is the idea of uh, the resolution equation. If you look at the resolution equation, it's not theoretical. It's, it's very practical, very applied. So when you talk about fast GC or faster GC, uh, the concept of cutting a column in half will give you half of the efficiency. So that's the downside. Upside, it's twice as fast. Cutting the diameter in half will give you twice the efficiency. So if you cut the length in half and the diameter in half, it'll keep the efficiency the same, but you could do the analysis in half the time. So think about what this means. If you are running right now with a uh, 30 meter, uh, 530 micron diameter column, if you cut the length to 15 meters, you cut the diameter to 250 micron, you will do the exact same separation, same efficiency, but nominally, you'll get it in half the time. And if you really try this, you'll find out that you can get it in less than half the time because of the Van Diemter plot. You shift out to a, to a higher linear velocity. So there's a huge advantage. And, and that's a, by the way, that's a no-brainer. That absolutely works. Cut the length in half. Cut the diameter in half. So if you want to get really crazy, you've got a 530 micron column. Cut the length by a factor of 5. So you go from a 30 meter down to a 6 meter. Cut the diameter by a factor of 5. Go from a 530 to a 100. You have now cut your analysis time five-fold by 80%, yet you get the same efficiency, which means you get the same resolution. The benefit, of course, it is, for starters, five times faster. And then since you have a more shallow Van Diemter, it shifts you out a little uh, further out, and it's actually much faster than, than five times faster. And that is the fundamentals of gas chromatography. And uh, I learned my fundamentals of gas chromatography from a great professor, Harold McNair. <laughs> You learned a lot of your chromatography in the lab yourself as well. <laughs> Let's wrap this program up. 